A lot has happened in the last few months. I have decided it would be best to record a summation of events so far to ensure that none of us get lost should we need to look back. My name is James Hunter. When I was seven years old, my parents were killed in a car crash. I spent the rest of my childhood raised in an orphanage run by nuns. I don't remember much about my time there, mostly just that I hated it, and I remember I often got locked in the book closet as a way of punishment. Guess I was a pretty naughty kid. Whilst I was there, I met a man named Carl Trevino, and the two of us became friends. I had a burgeoning interest in the supernatural at this point, and so did he. Together, we voraciously devoured every book we could find on the topic, and when I was around 17 years old, we escaped and fled. Now a normal life was never going to be on the cards for us. We had no official qualifications or marketable skills and, well, by this point I only cared about one thing. You see, I had become obsessed with the idea of proving that there was more to the world than that which we can see. It was my way of trying to prove that, even though they were dead, my parents were still out there somewhere. Fast forward several years, and Carl and I stopped working together. His interests took a darker turn than I was comfortable with. He wanted to explore ways to use the supernatural to benefit himself, whilst I only wanted knowledge and to understand. Looking back, I think the social isolation we kept wasn't exactly healthy for either of us two traumatized people living and stewing in their own trauma without outside help was probably not a smart move. So off I go, friendless and with a drinking problem too. Oh, don't worry, Carl comes back later on. Skipping ahead, I reach my thirties. Many investigations under my belt, several books published and still not a single confirmed sighting of the supernatural. Oh, and the drinking problem? That was still a thing, only now I'd graduated from beer to whiskey. Or rum. Or vodka. Oh, let's be honest, anything I could get my hands on. Years pass in a blur until eventually I give up. I realise that the cause I dedicated my entire life to was a mistake. That I was never going to find the answers I was chasing, and that in my single-minded quest to prove the supernatural, I had forgotten the normal human experience of building friendships and relationships. So basically, I shut myself in my apartment and decided I was going to drink until my liver finally gave in. But then one day... This... 25-year-old girl turns up on my doorstep. She's got dark, bushy hair, wide brown eyes, and she's wearing the biggest grin I've ever seen in my life. <laughs> Abigail Corbin. The truth is I was so hungover I could barely comprehend what she was saying. When she gets going, she speaks so quickly, spitting out words like machine gun fire. She asked me to come with her to a place called Greenvale, where a young man had killed his family and then himself. I turned her down at first, but she wore me down. Now, I didn't know this at the time, but leaving my apartment and going with her, that was the best decision of my life. What we uncovered was a mysterious radio broadcast something unlisted, broadcasting from an anonymous source at seemingly random intervals. The problem with this broadcast was that anyone who heard it was changed. They began to hallucinate, became paranoid, and eventually compulsively carved symbols and drawings into any surface that they could. The end result of this infection in nearly every case that we saw was that the victim became insane and lashed out at those around them before ultimately taking their own life. Now, the interesting thing that we did note was that this process wasn't an exact science. It seemed to affect each individual person differently. 
For example, Mark Rawlinson succumbed fairly quickly. However, Melissa Black was able to fight for several weeks, which was then further extended when the doctors at the hospital placed her in a medically induced coma. Now, trying to find the source of the signal was not a quick or easy thing to do. So, as we searched for answers, Abigail roped me into helping her investigate other strange events around the country. Sometimes with the help of her ex-boyfriend, but kind of still a friend, Dan Cowell. Dan can be a little bit tiresome, but he's a police officer, and those connections come in handy. Over the course of a few months, we had several adventures. We helped Dan catch a serial killer in Greenvale, investigated a cursed photograph in a seaside town, we exposed a fraudster faking a haunted house, and even tackled a werefox at a paranormal-themed convention. But of course, it wasn't all fun. A few weeks into our investigation, I discovered that Abigail had listened to the signal, that she was struggling to fight off its effects. She listened to it when we were trying to help Melissa Black because, in her own words, she believed I could save her. I was furious with her. I couldn't understand why she would put so much faith in me. I was so angry about it. Racing against the clock, I was able to track down a Professor Michael Cross, who was part of a project that had initially tried to create a medical device that would allow electric signals from the brain to be converted into speech, allowing victims with paralysis the ability to talk again. Now also part of this project was a Professor Malcolm Halliday, and that is when all of the pieces started to come together. You see, Halliday had lost his daughter three years previously, killed in a terrible case of bullying gone too far by several college kids, which included the original victims of the signal. Since that time, he'd been trying to improve the device to allow it to pick up signals not from a human brain, but from somewhere beyond our world, a nether realm he called the Abyss. Halliday believed he could use the device to communicate with his dead daughter. Now, I know what you're thinking. Why would a man of science turn to such a seemingly crackpot solution? Well, aside from the fact that grief can do a hell of a number on a person, it turned out that Halliday had a benefactor, steering him in the right direction. Enter my old friend, Carl Trevino. Predictably, for a man obsessed with gaining occult power, Carl betrayed Halliday and, using an ancient artifact called the Pythagoras Prism, was able to boost the signal and broadcast it across Greenvale. I've never seen anything like it. Half the town were affected, becoming a wild and violent mob, and Abigail amongst them. Fortunately, Working with Professor Cross, we were able to use the principle of active noise control to create an anti-wave and cancel out the signal and save the town. But of course, life is never quite that simple. Carl revealed that the machine was never intended to contact the souls of the dead, but rather something else. Some unknown force that he believed resided within the abyss. A demon. The signal was the voice of this demon, unable to be processed by human ears. Carl said he was using the voice to receive guidance as he sought revenge on the people who ran the orphanage we grew up in. You see, I never realized just how foggy my memory of that time was until Carl told me this. I remember that I didn't like it there and I remember that the sisters who ran the orphanage were often a little too shall we say enthusiastic about doling out punishment but what Carl was talking about why can't I remember any of it Carl fled but not before leaving me with a clue two words little hope meanwhile Abigail was able to fight off the remains of the signal and we destroyed the Pythagoras prism so it could never be used again Abigail and I decided to go on a journey to try and hunt down Carl Trevino and try and find out what little hope meant. Oh, and uh, she invited Deputy Dan along as well. That pretty much sums up everything that you need to know. 
Now we're on the road trying to catch up to Carl on what seems like a wild goose chase. He always seems to be one step ahead of us. And if that wasn't bad enough, I'm worried about Abigail. Recovering from the signal hasn't exactly been easy. Whatever lies ahead for us, I can't help but think that things are going to get a lot worse before they get any better.